We start a new series today, preaching through the book of Daniel. This will not be my first pass preaching through the book of Daniel. This will be my third time in my life preaching through the book of Daniel. And the messages will all be new, fresh, written messages just for you, though. Years ago on Sunday nights, I preached through the book of Daniel, and an elderly man in the church came up to me after I was three or four messages in, and he encouraged me by saying, I think you're a lot more excited about this than we are. So if that's the kind of gift of encouragement you have, keep it to yourself. <laughs> what the man said. I think you're more excited about this than we are. He was older, and the Bible says, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. Or I might have said, that says more about you than it does about me. Another fellow in the church whose name was Jim, a dear friend, thought he would be funny, and he came up to me during the series on Daniel, and he said to me, Ken, you have been at Daniel for a very long time. It seems like we've been in Daniel longer than he was in Babylon. <laughs> and that was funnier, but no nicer. The same fellow, he was a good guy. He did, did a lot of kind things, was a dear family friend, and he came and visited me in a new church. He and his wife, I remember that day, they sat there, in the office, and they talked with me for a while, and we remembered old times, and we laughed, and we cried, and we prayed. When he got ready to leave, he turned around, and he looked at my bookshelf, and at the bottom of my bookshelf was a three-ring binder. It was red, and it said Daniel on the binder, and he took it with him, and he said, I'm going to take this with me, because I don't want you to hurt the people in your new church with it. So again, if you have the gift of encouragement like that, I would just appreciate it if you keep it to yourself. But after a while, I took those stories home and I told my family what was said, whether that was wise or not, the jury's out on that, but I got a letter from a young man in the church a few weeks after that was my oldest son, Kyle. We talked on the phone, or we texted this morning about this. And he brought it up without me bringing it up to him. I told him that I was going to be preaching through Daniel. And he said to me, Dad, I remember when I was a boy and you preached through Daniel on a Sunday night. That had a big impact on my life. And I got that letter from my son who gave me a list of things that he learned in preaching through the book of Daniel. So before I even begin preaching through the book of Daniel, this could seem to you like you could be a lot less excited about it than me. It's possible. Or it could seem to you like we will be in Daniel longer than he was in Babylon, if you're wired like that. Or at the end of this series, you could have a little list of things that God did in your heart. And I'll do my best but I want to ask you if you would be willing to do your best. And here's what I'm going to suggest. I, I want to suggest that you participate with me in giving attendance to the Word of God. This is the book of Daniel. This is one of the most amazing collections of stories, dreams, and prophecies ever penned by humankind, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. This is God's Word that helps us understand the past, and there are prophecies, prophecies in it that are still unfulfilled, which will be fulfilled in the future and maybe soon. And so I want to ask you, I want to call you as a church to do more than just, you know, come and attend, but certainly attend and invite others to attend. It's kind of like recommending a good restaurant. If you're excited about it, other people will be excited about it, and it could change their lives. If you talk with enthusiasm about the Bible, about the book of Daniel, and what God has to say in Daniel, these are times when there are those around us who are really 
wondering what in the world is going on. And we need to go to a place we can trust for those answers. And so I would recommend that you come and that you attend. I would also recommend that you think of others and invite them not to hear me, but to hear this, the teaching of this passage, these passages. Second thing I would suggest is that you read ahead, that you, that you actually study ahead. And it's not really hard to do. One of the ways to do it would be read the text. You know the next chunk that we're going to be. We're in Daniel 2, Lord willing, next week. And so each day you could read Daniel 2. It's a wonderful story. And it's narrative. It's fascinating. It's riveting narrative. And you could read Daniel 2 all week along with your regular Bible reading. Or you could say, I read the next chunk on Sunday afternoon. But in other words, next Sunday, if I get up to preach, and if I say to you, well, this isn't going to be very good because I didn't really study this week. I'm just going to read it and just kind of talk off the cuff. You would rightly charge me with... Um, malfeasance. She's like, that's malpractice as a pastor. You should have studied ahead. And I would just say to you, if you read ahead and you study ahead, it will mean more to you. And if you ask questions of the text, so read it and say, when you have a question, write it down. And then again, if you read and study ahead, the folks in the Bible study fellowship, you, you probably heard me mention this before. When you talk with somebody from Bible study fellowship, you would think the people were on drugs that are so enthused about the Bible. You're like, what did you take? You're not laughing. That was supposed to be a joke. Do I have to tell you when I'm being funny? They're all excited about the Bible. You think, what do they do at Bible Study Fellowship? Do they give you a special pill? Do you smoke something before you go? What? There, now you're listening. Yeah, what is it about that? Well, of course they don't. Here's what they do. They study the Bible ahead of time. And then they have a small group talk about the Bible ahead of time. And then they talk about the Bible in a public meeting. And you talk to Bible study fellowship people and you will never get any of them to tell you about their secret sauce or what they take or smoke or drink. or They don't do that. They just, they just study the Bible. And so I really strongly recommend you'll get a lot more out of the teaching of God's word if you read it ahead of time. You know where we're going. Read ahead of time. Study ahead of time. Write down questions ahead of time. Here, here's another thing that's super helpful. And that is, Whenever you're looking at a passage of Scripture, ask the question, what's the big idea here? Or another way to say that would be, who's the original author and who's the original audience and what was the author's intent with the original audience? To answer that question accurately will break the Scriptures wide open for you personally. It's shocking how much you get personally out of the Bible when you answer that question. Who wrote this? What was the setting? Who was he writing it to? What was going on? How did this make them feel? What did he expect of them? What was he trying to get them to do? What was he trying to get them to understand? What was the authorial intent? What was the author's intent? When you do that, you're a long way toward a powerful experience yourself with the Word of God in whatever circumstance you're going through in your life. So I would ask you, please pray for me as I prepare these messages I'm just out ahead of you a bit. And pray for me as I prepare these messages that I would walk with the Lord and would have an understanding of the scriptures and be able to explain them in such a way that is helpful to you. Pray for others that they will come and hear the teaching of the word of God or log on, look at, watch it online. Pray for yourself that your heart would be ready. And next Sunday, when I get up to preach and I say, how many of you read Daniel chapter two? Please don't discourage me now. Let's just see a sea of hands out there where everybody just puts their hand up because they read the scriptures ahead of time. Please do that. Years ago, we went on what we call the manly, manly man adventure. Do you remember this, Hope? We went on the manly man adventure, and we decided one year we went on the manly man adventure to North Manitou Island, and we had the meltdown on North Manitou, or I had gout, and it was really bad. And we wrote about it on the internet, and a friend of mine who owns a cottage on an island wrote me, and he said, Ken, next time you go to an island, come to my island, because we have a ferry, and you can put your Jeep on the ferry, and you won't have to walk everywhere you go. So even if you have gout, you can have a great vacation. So the next year, we went to Boblo Island up in the Straits of Mackinac where my friend Scott had a cottage. And it was for the manly man adventure, but 
Hope is kind of our favorite, and she's the baby of the family, and she's spoiled, so we decided we would bring her along. And then she says to me, I know why you're bringing me along. You're bringing me along so that I will cook. And since my plan was foiled, I had to say, no, I'm going to do all the cooking, and I did. And we had a wonderful time up on the, up on the Boblo Island on the Straits of Mackinac. Something unusual happened that week, though, that I was reminded of as I began into Daniel in chapter 1. I have a son. We have a son whose name is Daniel. And Daniel was finished his senior year of high school, and uh, he finished his senior year of college. And during the week, he was going to have to leave early, and he was going to have to get on the ferry a day ahead of all of us. Remember this, Opie? And he was going to go away to the southwest and he was going to work in oil, and he was going to pay back his college debt, and he was going to not get married to a girl in New Mexico, and he was going to come home and be with us. And uh, you probably know how that story went. Uh, he lasted a few weeks in Mexico before he met a nice Christian girl, married her. They have three little boys, and they live in New Mexico. And their anniversary was yesterday, I think, anniversary six yesterday. But I have a little video of the day he left. He got on the ferry, and we were all over here. You remember this, Opie? And, and we were saying, goodbye, Danny. We love you. See you soon. And Danny was out on the ferry, and he was all alone out there on that big ship, and he, he was waving goodbye, and he said, goodbye, I love you too. And our voices were thick with emotion as we said goodbye. It was so hard to say goodbye if you had an experience like that. Nathan, how old are you? What is it? 13? 13. And when will your, when's your birthday? Oh, so soon you'll be 14. You're perfect for this. So I'm going to use you as an example, even though I didn't ask permission ahead of time. Nathan, um, Nathan is uh, almost 14 years old. And Daniel, when we meet him in Daniel chapter 1, is probably Nathan's age. So if you take, imagine Nathan here, who is, who's greatly loved here and greatly loved by his family. And you imagine that he's taken captive. He's not coming home. He is mistreated. He is abused. He is captured and taken 700 miles away. And he is not coming home. He comes from a devout home of devout believers in Jesus Christ who love him desperately and have trained him carefully. But now he's going to be in the three-year University of Babylon, learning the language and the customs of the ungodly who hate God. If you understand, this is a very sad, sad passage of Scripture. As a matter of fact, usually when we read this, and usually when we preach from Daniel in chapter 1, we ignore the emotional context of the passage. We don't imagine a, a, a bunch of our finest 14, 15-year-old young men stripped to the waist, lashed together, drug off on the dusty road, dusty road on a 700-mile trek into slavery. We don't see the painful reality of that. But there was a psalmist who did. Psalm 137 captures the emotional context. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung our lyres. Where, where is the psalmist? In Babylon. What's he thinking about? Zion. For there our captors required us songs and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth. For if I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. And then he laps into imprecatory prayers, dark prayers, capturing the emotional context of Daniel and chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1, written by Daniel probably when he's well over 80, probably nine, some, some think maybe 90 years old. And Daniel now is looking back on his life, 
and he's reconstructing six amazing stories. In the first six chapters of Daniel, he tells stories that characterize his circumstances and his life with God in Babylon. And through all these uh, different, the rise and fall of kingdoms. And then God gives Daniel understanding. He gives him his own visions, his understanding and interpretation of others' visions. And these some are prophetic about the future to comfort the people of God. And these are recorded in chapter, Daniel chapter 7 through 12. So the first half are primarily stories. And the second half of Daniel are primarily prophecies. Some prophecies occur in the first six. Some stories occur in the second six. But that's essentially it. There's another kind of structure. We'll talk about it later. But what I'd like to do this morning is for us to begin here by looking at the, this story in three scenes. And I think what it will do is it'll help us as we face some of the dark difficulties that we have and some of the things that we face as a people and some of the things that we face as a nation and some of the things that we face as a family and, what, and, and the prospect of what will happen with our fine young men and young women for the future. Scene one I have called Judah's tragedy. I wish that I could play a dirge music while I read verses one through six, because that's what you should be hearing. The saddest and most melancholy thing, as you imagine in verse one, you have a very dark fulfillment. Here you have a promise of God that if people, if his people will honor his ways, if they will keep his law, if they'll remember the Sabbath if, they will, Sabbath, if they will avoid idolatry, then he will pour out upon them his divine blessing. But if they will not, then they will have not a blessing, but judgment that comes on them. This, these are the ways of God. For those who obey God will experience his blessing, and those who disobey God will have judgment. And now the judgment comes due on Jerusalem with a godless king, uh, Jehoiakim. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, comes to Jerusalem and besieges. He's on his way home from the victory in Carchemish over, uh, over Egypt, and he sweeps past Jerusalem and takes Jerusalem really without firing a shot. It's a brief siege. And so he takes then, in, in the text of Scripture, it appears like he has just a handful of things from sacred things from the temple. But history tells us that he's, he's just ravaged the temple and he's taken thousands of items from the temple. And he's taken them from the temple of God and he's put them into the temple of pagan gods. It's an, it's an in-your-face move of judgment. This is a dark passage. There's a dark fulfillment here. The king, Jehoiakim, is not a faithful king of Judah. He's a faithless king. He's a godless king. And ironically, he's the son of Josiah, who was a godly king. And, and as the Bible says, you know, when Josiah became king at eight, and later in his reign, they discovered the law of God. And when Josiah discovered the law of God, the Bible says they read it to him, and he tore his clothes, and he humbled himself. And there was a great revival under Josiah, which Daniel's parents were probably privy to. They are probably part of that. He was probably a part of that. Ezekiel, but... but Josiah's son was a part of that, but was unaffected by it, and he was, he was godless. Later, God sends a prophet to this king, Jehoiakim, and the prophet's name is Jeremiah. And with a word from the Lord, Jeremiah warns Jehoiakim. His father, when he was exposed to the law of God, tore his clothes and started a revival. But this king, when he was exposed to a prophecy of the law of God from Jeremiah, the Bible says he took it and he set before the fire and he cut it with a knife and he burned it in the fire. And unless I get ahead of myself, what we're going to see in this story of Daniel, this first story of Daniel, is people, when they get a hold of God's word and they humble themselves and they tear their clothes and they obey the word of God and they honor the God of the Bible, God's blessing comes on them. But people who disregard when they cut God's word and, and they splice God's word and they burn God's word, they disregard God's word, they have only judgment that they're going to face in the future. There are stern warnings about this in God's word. I want you to listen for a minute to what God says to his people in Deuteronomy in chapter 28. 
Deuteronomy 28 has two parts. It has a part that you could call blessing, and it's a part that you could call curse. God is saying to his people in Deuteronomy, if you keep my law, you will have my blessing. If you don't keep my law, you will have nothing but judgment. Listen a little bit to the tenor of this from Deuteronomy 28. This would be very, it's a lengthy passage, which we won't read all here in the pulpit, but I would encourage you this afternoon to read this. It's grave to read it. If you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all the commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above the nations of the earth, and all these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord our God. In other words, I'm going to chase you down to bless you if you obey the word. Blessed will you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of the ground and the fruit of your cattle and the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in. Blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before you. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you and your barns and all that you undertake. And it goes on for 14 verses and promises a blessing on those who obey God's word. But then it takes a very dark turn. And for the rest of this, all the way into the 60, I think it's 68 verses here, it talks about the curse on disobedience, the judgment that comes on disobedience. You say, is God dealing with us in this exact same way as he dealt with his people Israel? And I would say, no, but he's the same God who has the same disposition toward obedience and the same disposition toward disobedience. Here's what I believe with all of my heart. If you want to understand what you see happening in America today, you need to read Deuteronomy 28. If you want to understand what's happening in our nation with the rich heritage that we've had, and the many blessings that we've had as a nation. You want to understand it in the context of Romans in chapter 1. And if you don't, then you're disregarding who God is. Listen to what he says. If you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. And then it just, it's, it's almost too dark to read publicly. The sad, there's a dark fulfillment in verse 1 of of Daniel and chapter 1. And that dark fulfillment is that because God's people have violated the Sabbaths and because God's people have violated his law and because God's people have disregarded his prophets and because God's people have taken a penknife to God's word and burned it in the fire and because God's people have been involved in idolatry, God allows a pagan, godless dictator, if you will, to take them captive and take things from the temple of the one true God and put them in the temple of godless people. And he calls them, my, calls Nebuchadnezzar, as he does later Cyrus, he calls him my servant in the providence of God. There's a dark fulfillment here. There's a dark defeat here. There's a dark blasphemy here to take these things that belong to God and drag them off into the courts of a false God. There's a dark bondage here as these young men, not just Daniel uh, Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, but others with them. They, were, they weren't alone. To, to have young people taken captive, drugged off away from their parents, just a dark bondage, just a dark departure, the sad going away. There's a dark journey ahead of them. There's a dark education before them. Three years in the University of Babylon, eat at the king's table, probably unclean meat, un wine and drink, drink and food offered to idols perhaps. Probably they were made eunuchs. We know this because in the ancient world it was common for slaves to be made eunuchs because 2 Kings chapter 20 and verse 18 says this would happen to some because Daniel never married because um, he, the, the young men answered to the chief eunuch or the chief of eunuchs is not at all unlikely that they were made eunuchs. And this is significant because we live in a time when many have had terrible abuse and have suffered terrible abuse, even physical abuse, even emotional abuse, even psychological abuse, and God forbid, even sexual abuse. And we're looking, aren't we, for what is the answer for people who have been so terribly abused? What is the answer for people who have suffered such terrible suffering? Is there hope for them? Is it true that God 
will bless with a mighty and powerful spirit, a person who has had, who has had to suffer dark sexual abuse, dark emotional abuse, dark spiritual abuse. And the answer would be very clear from these stories that God loves to bless people who will honor him even with the heartaches that they've had. There's a dark education. There's a dark defilement. There's a dark injury. There's dark injustice. There's dark identity. Their names, look in verses 6 and 7, among them Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. These are all names that uh, honor God. They're names that, that honor God, and they're given names that honor false deities. The chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel, he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah, he called Shadrach. Mish- Mishael, he called Meshach. Azariah, he called Abednego or Abednego. These were given the names of false gods. Can you just imagine that? This is dark. I wish I did this for Lois last night. I said, I'm going to read this, but I'm going to play music appropriate to it. And I played the music. Sad. This is the music that you should hear when you read this. It's just the darkest, saddest funeral dirge of music. How sad. Daniel says, I remember when they took me away from mom. I remember when they took me away from dad. I remember when they took me away from all that, that I loved, home and the temple and all of that in Jerusalem. And I never saw them again. This is sad. These men were young, and they were powerless. They're far from home, and they must have felt like their God was losing and that evil was winning, and the days were dark, and they were abused, probably sexually, certainly physically and emotionally. God seemed silent. There are times when God is silent. There are times, for instance, when Malachi comes to a close. There are 400 silent years before Matthew happens. They lived in a time of God's judgment. And again, I repeat, I think if you want to understand, some, we watch the evening news, we listen to, we read the newspapers, we listen to our peers, we see what's happening, and we think, what is going on? And I will tell you, I think the people who understand the world best look to the Bible to see what is going on. And what you see is Romans chapter 1. Read Romans chapter 1 slowly and carefully, and you will have an understanding of why things have gone upside down when people covenantally, publicly disregard God's law. You cannot expect God's blessing. This is what happened in Israel. I believe it's happening in America. And it's a pathetic scene, very dark drama being played out today. Maybe you have times like this yourself. Maybe you feel like you're far from home and things seem dark and confusing to you and you feel distant from God. And sometimes you even wonder if God's word is true or if God really is winning and evil is, or evil is winning and you feel disappointment. Maybe you've had an experience that's, made, that's shaken your faith to its very core. You've had trouble on top of trouble or tragedy come to your life or you felt like life is unfair and you're clinging to faith but it's hard for you to believe. Sometimes you look at the circumstances of your life and you compare them to others and you think, how can I see God in this? This must have been how some of these young men felt during that time. What should you do? Maybe life has been hard for you. I recently watched a a young television program about a young woman who was physically abused and fled an abusive marriage and everything went upside down in her life. Everything on top, everything went bad. Everything went hard. Everything about her life was hard. And I literally begin to sob and weep because our family's been touched by the same injustice, the same sadness. And I just begin to weep. Maybe that you've had times when weeping comes because you identify so much with how broken our world is and how that brokenness hasn't left you alone. This is why we've taken up the book of Daniel. Is there hope in the book of Daniel? How does a godly person respond in a time like this? This we're going to see, and we'll see it in scene two. So the first scene, and I'm glad we're done with it, is Judah's dark tragedy and Nebuchadnezzar's blasphemy. But the second scene begins with Daniel's resolution in chapter 1 and verse 8. Daniel, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself. Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself. God moves this young man, taken captive, very young, 
to say, I will not defile myself. Daniel resolves to honor God, even though he's young, even though God seems silent, even when it seems like he's serving a losing clause, clause, even when others are blaspheming God around him. Does this sound familiar to anyone? Even when things seem dark, even when he's physically, emotionally, spiritually, and intellectually abused, even though his identity is assaulted, he makes up his mind, he resolves that he will not defile himself. I believe, this my guess is, this is the combination of training that he's had in his youth. But more than anything else, it's the movement of God upon him that God has a, young, has a remnant and is represented in a young man who says, if everyone else around me is going to defile themselves and do what's wrong, we're not even sure exactly, precisely what it is that would make that a defilement, but we know that eating the king's meat and drinking the king's wine would be a defilement because he says it is. Daniel's not a rebel here. He doesn't just say, I don't care what you tell me to do, I'm not going to do it. He actually tries to obey the delegated authorities over him and obey God beyond that. And so he does something wonderful. He comes up with a creative alternative so that he can be under his God, the, the, the authorities appointed over him and the sub-authorities appointed over him and still obey God. And you see that. Notice it says, but Daniel resolved in verse 8. Now, notice again, verse, verse 2 tells what's behind the captivity Verse 2, the first four words are what? Verse 2, the first four words are, the Lord gave Jehoiakim. That phrase, the Lord gave, happens three times in the first chapter. Daniel says, the Lord gave Judah into the hands of Babylon. The Lord allowed that to happen. Then it says, Daniel resolved, but look at what verse 9 says. And the Lord, there it is again. What does it say? And, and God gave Daniel favor. Daniel resolved, God gave him favor. The title of my message is, Honor God with Your Life and See What Happens. A, a, a longer title would be, Resolve to Honor God with Your Life and See What God Does. Experience His Blessing. This is the answer in a time of God's judgment is where are the Daniels who will say, I will honor God with my life. Where are the Esthers who will say, I will honor God with my life, even if I'm young, even if I'm far from home, even if everybody else is doing something else, even if they're trying to brainwash me in the culture that I'm in, which they are, even if everybody else on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook disagree, I resolve I will not defile myself. Then the Bible says, and God will give you favor with who you need to have favor with, if you will. Now I want you to notice that. Verse 10, chief of the eunuchs says to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who assigned your food and your drink. Why should he see that you are worse conditioned than the youths who are your own age so that would endanger my head with the king? It's not terribly subtle what he's saying. If I do this wrong, this guy is going to chop my head off. Daniel, if you don't mind, I kind of like my head, he's saying. Verse 11, Daniel says to the steward, Again, this is a third level of delegated authority. Not the godless king, not Ashpenaz, chief of the eunuchs, but the steward of Ashpenaz, the king of the eunuchs, assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He says, test your servants for 10 days and let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. This has been a really fun thing to read over and over this week. Eat vegetables, drink water. Sounds like my mother. Eat vegetables, drink water. Dr. Dr. McDougal is right here in the Bible. Eat vegetables drink water. I'm like, okay, I'll do it for 10 days. Um, it gets longer than that. Let your appearance and the appearance of the youths eat the king's food be observed. Compare us. And deal with your servants as you see. Daniel's boldly making a creative appeal. He says, okay, we won't preach inside. We'll preach on the roof. How would that be? You remember doing that? We, this is the passage of Scripture we base that idea on. Let's just keep obeying God, but let's also be under government authorities as much as we possibly can. Let's go out and preach on the roof. And then we got a little bit scared. Dennis Conant, it, I hope I'm not getting in trouble with Dennis, and he, he made a call to the, to the governor's office, and, and he inquired with the governor and, and, and with the people and said, we want to be people under authority, but we want to obey God, essentially. And, we, and, and then the elders got together and kind of gave us a head, keep preaching on the roof. 
We didn't preach on the roof because we didn't want to be under authority. We preach on the roof because we want to be under authority, but we want to obey God. So when we decide that we're not rebels at heart, we're not eager to disobey, we want to make the king successful if we can, even if the circumstances are ugly, even if we don't philosophically agree, but we want to obey God, and we will obey God, we resolve to obey God. Listen, here's what I'm getting at. This is the heart of the message. When a person resolves to obey God by the work of the Spirit in them, they resolve to obey God and the Word of God, see what happens Watch God give you favor with who you need to have way favor with. Watch God do what no man can do. Life gets exciting when you obey God and you honor God with your life. If I'm a young person, this is what I need to hear. What God did with Daniel, God will still do with young men and women today. If a young woman will get down by her bed at nighttime and will kneel down and say, God, I'm all yours and I will follow you and I will not defile myself and if I do, I'll seek forgiveness and go on. The same God who honored Daniel will honor that girl. If a person that's made a mess of their life comes to a point in their life where they say, God, I've made a mess of my life, and they go home and they get down on their knees and they go, God, up until this point, I've just made a mess of things, but I'm gonna honor you. I'm gonna dedicate myself. I purpose in my heart. I will not defile myself. The God of heaven and his angel armies will act on that person's behalf and answer their prayers. Trust God, honor God with your life, and see what he does. Okay, we're gonna have to kick into next week on this, and here's why. Normally, when I get to the end of a message, which I haven't, because the third scene is God's blessing, and to give you just a quick synopsis of that, you see it in verse two, you see it in verse nine, and you see it in verse 17. These youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, in Daniel, understanding with visions and dreams, and it gets to the end, and it says, and he continued to serve faithfully through King Cyrus. So what I normally do is I come to the end of a message and then I tell a story to illustrate what I said. But I'm not going to do that today. But I am going to ask David Lemon to come. Because David, come. He, David was in the study the other day. And he is uh, going to embarrass him. But he's kind of like a Daniel guy, raised by godly parents. Loves the Lord and wants to serve the Lord. Humbles himself under God. He's one of our, our elders. He told me a story that was so encouraging that I asked him that if he closed our service today by telling that story to you, that God would raise up other guys, other men like Daniel, that would follow God, that would, would find God people. So David, tell him your story here and then pray, all right? Sorry to embarrass you there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was at the uh, men's prayer breakfast and shared um, just a little story uh, of growing up. Uh, my parents... Uh, if you don't know, we're missionaries in Ecuador. Um, my dad's a missionary pilot, and uh, yeah, that was, I, I consider that a privilege to have, to have grown up there, and I'm grateful to God for that experience. Um, they went down there um, when I was two years old, and uh, we lived on a missionary compound down there uh, with a bunch of other families. Um, and there was another mission compound of another missionary group that was close by, and I had lots of friends, um, <clears throat> most of them right close by. But in uh, 1987, uh, 88, somewhere around in there, we were asked to go and serve uh, in Sakua. Um, and that meant we would be out there alone. Um, it was only going to be for six months. We were helping cover for another family out there. Uh, it's just a little bit farther south. It's farther down the road. It's a quick flight. It's a long drive. <laughs> um, and uh, so we went out there. Uh, I know my mom was thrilled. Uh, <laughs> she got to homeschool us. Um, she went to school to be a teacher, quickly decided she didn't like that very much. So uh, that was that was a challenge for her, I'm sure. Um, us kids just uh, going through schoolwork and, and needing her to, to guide and direct us through that. Um, yeah, I remember this part of being in Sakua clearly to this day, and that's that after we'd been out there for a while and I realized um, I had made a few local friends, we would. <laughs> We would play baseball out in a gravel field. I think we had one ball, one bat, maybe two gloves at the most, once in a while. Um, 
and some of the locals would join in, but for the most part, it was lonely. And uh, we were alone. I had my brother. Um, he's a year and a half younger than me. My sister's five years younger, so she would have been uh, four years old at the time, and I was nine. Um, yeah, I, I was just lonely, and I remember getting word that I could go on a field trip with my class at the school, the missionary kids' school that I had gone to, and I could go on, see all my friends and have a, a good time and reconnect. Um, and I was excited for that, naturally. Nine-year-old kid, woo, I get to go to my friends. This is going to be a good time. Um, and as the, the day approached for that, um, as the week started, um, I'm pretty sure that was a weekend trip. It started to rain. <laughs> And when you're in the Amazon rainforest on the edge of it by the Andes Mountains, it just rains, and then it just keeps raining. And as it got closer, I started to, to realize uh, two things. One, you can't land an airplane if you can't see where you're going to land, um, and that the rain is falling from those clouds that are going to keep the pilot from seeing that runway. So, um, yeah. I. I had been raised in a Christian home. I'm nine years old, but I know I just need to pray. And at first, it was almost a, uh, like, of course God will answer this. Just take the rain away. No problem. And so, ask the Lord to take, make the clouds go away. You know, open it up. The sun will shine. Everything will be great. <laughs> um, and the next day, it's still raining. Um, as that morning rolled around, um, and I woke up, I still remember the window in that room and that the rain was hitting our tin roof. And it wasn't hard rain, it was gentle, but it was sad. It was still raining. Uh, and that point I knew I, I may not get to go on this trip. And um, heartbroken nine-year-old that I was and looking out that window and seeing the rain hitting the tops of, of the neighbor's trees next door and just dripping off and it's just water everywhere. Um, I really started to pray and I just broke down and, and cried out to God and just, yeah, I wept in that window. I, I wanted to go so bad. And um, I, I don't remember what time of day it happened, but I was still sad, mostly thinking I wasn't going to get to go on this trip. And um, I remember my dad walking in, okay, you're ready to go, right? Because the airplane's already landed. And I'm like, it's still raining. I don't know. Um, I don't know how that happened. I, it doesn't matter if I'm ready or not. I'm going to go jump in that airplane <laughs> to close my back and go on this trip. Uh, I'm just so excited to, to be with my friends and enjoy that week, weekend, a couple days. And um, anyway... I went to the runway, got in that airplane. I don't remember any of the field trip. <laughs> I really don't. Um, I, I know who the teacher was at that time, and I know who my friends were. I don't remember much of that trip. Um, what I remember is what the pilot said to me when I got in the airplane to go home, or to fly back to what I would consider home. We were in Sakua. That, that, just never quite sank in as being home. But um, he basically said, you know, he, as he flew by uh, Sukua, um, and it's rainy and it's cloudy, and you gotta be able to see the runway to land, he basically looked down through a hole in the clouds, could see the runway, he knew where to go. So he turned the airplane down, landed the airplane. You don't have to have uh, a clearing of the skies. You don't have to have the rain stop. Um, but if, God will answer your prayer. He is faithful. And he was faithful to me and cemented the faith of a nine-year-old who just wanted to go on a field trip. Um, and there's many other little stories like that throughout my life, but that uh, just cemented in my life that God is, loves me dearly, is listening to me, and will answer, um, we'll answer my prayers. Thanks. Um, I'm going to